So I'm John Quelch, the uh, Dean of uh, the Miami Herbert Business School, and uh, I'm co-hosting this event this evening with uh, Professor Patricia Abril, uh, who is uh, also an Associate Vice Provost. Associate Dean, my goodness, okay, I've got to watch out. Um, so, um, Patricia used to be the uh, Vice Dean for graduate programs here at the uh, business school and is still a professor of business law here, but is now working with uh, the Provost uh, in the central administration as well. Um, also want to acknowledge we have uh, one of uh, my Dean colleagues here, Karen Wilkins, who's kindly come over from the uh, School of Communications, and uh, very pleased to welcome you, Karen. Thank you. Um, so Patricia is first of all going to introduce uh, uh, Laurie Silvers, and then I will say a few words about Mitchell Rubenstein. Thank you, Dean. I'm so pleased to be here tonight. Laurie Silvers and Mitchell Rubenstein have enhanced South Florida the ever-changing world of media and the University of Miami with their foresight, leadership, mentorship, and philanthropy. These are truly visionaries in every sense of the word. After a decade of practicing media law, Lori and Mitch co-founded the Sci-Fi Channel in 1992, attracting viewers in roughly 10 million homes with cable TV on the night the channel debuted. The largest basic cable launch since Ted Turner's TNT channel. Lori and Mitch eventually sold the channel, now owned by MC, NBC Universal, to the USA Network, but went on to build a conglomerate of radio, TV, cable, and internet. Today, they are co-CEOs of Hollywood.com, the majority owner of four Florida FM radio stations and co-founders and owners of the global esports organization, Misfits which owns esports teams with franchises in the Overwatch League, Call of Duty League, and the League of Legends. The former chair of Miami PBS station Channel 2 and co-chair of South Florida PBS, Lori also accomplished what others had failed to do for 20 years. She oversaw the merger of Miami and Palm Beach County's PBS stations, creating South Florida PBS, the seventh largest PBS station in the country. A life trustee of the Kravis Center for the Performing Arts in West Palm Beach, a member of the South Florida PBS Board and National PBS Foundation Board, she has received many honors, including the Women of Tomorrow Empowerment Award, the Sun Sentinel's 2011 Excalibur Award, and the Association of Fundraising Professionals 2015 Outstanding Philanthropist. All right, so. Um Mitchell, uh, I'm going to introduce as well. So Mitchell uh, practiced media law before turning to full-time entrepreneurial endeavors, uh, including starting the Sci-Fi Channel with Laurie. By the way, how many people here watch the Sci-Fi Channel? Come on, put your hands up, all, the, all of you Doctor Who fans from way back when. Um, as a building block in the launch of Sci-Fi, uh, Laurie and Mitchell recruited Gene Roddenberry, the creator of Star Trek, and also Isaac Asimov uh, to join their board of directors. Even before the channel's launch, a fan network developed organically, which Laurie and Mitch organized into over 200 chapters. And the fan base uh, was instrumental in demonstrating interest for the channel to cable operators, uh, who of course were necessary to uh, launch sci-fi uh, into being the biggest, uh, the second biggest uh, launch in cable TV history. So Mitchell was also the inaugural chair of Jewish life at Duke University which includes the Rubenstein Silvers Hillel at Duke. Uh, Mitchell received his law degree from the University of Virginia School of Law and an LLM in tax from the New York University School of Law. So there's one thing I didn't say, which is almost the most important, which is that Lori has served UM for more than 16 years. A two-time UM alumna, she's currently the chair of UM's Board of Trustees. The couple's generosity created an endowed distinguished professorship and scholarships, including one for students committed to public service. The Lori Silvers and Mitchell Rubenstein Hall, which houses the, the law school's award-winning clinics, is named in their honor. So 
without further ado, we get to the meat of it. So let's have a big round of applause for the chair of the Board of Trustees of the University of Miami. Come on. Give them a good Miami Herbert welcome here. Thank you. All right, thank you very much indeed. And uh, uh, what I want to ask uh, you uh, first, if I may, is how did you get together? How did this partnership come about? Uh, well, we met in high school, Miami Beach Senior High School, Beach High. Um, any Beach Highers here? Anyone from Beach High? No. No? OK, good. So I can lie about our experience. <laughs> Um, but we didn't get married. We were not dating in high school or anything like that. Um, but we ended up practicing law together because we knew each other and then went into business together. And from that relationship, the business relationship, uh, we fell in love and got married. Aww. <laughs> Any uh, revise and resubmit? Um, as chair of the board of the University of Miami Board of Trustees, um, I cannot comment further. Um, you'll just have to read the book. All right. So let, let's talk a little bit about the Sci-Fi Channel to begin with, because I think everybody uh, very familiar with that. How, how did uh, the idea to establish this cable network come about? I'm going to let him take it. And then if I don't like his answer, I'll correct it. All right. It's going to be a long night. Uh, so it was my idea. Um, and Lori said, why not a hair and makeup channel? She really did. Um, but so what I did was, she, most people, when they first hear the idea, now that it's out there and successful, it's easy to think how obvious it is, um, was to take Lori, my first test case, to what was then Blockbuster Video, no longer exists today, and show all the shelf space devoted to science fiction. And then to bookstores, keep in mind, this is pre-internet. Um, and, so and then the, the highest grossing movies ever were and still are in the science fiction category. And so with that as our um, kind of foundational um, easy to do research. We then got more serious and hired the Gallup organization, a leading polling company, to uh, research people around the country. And they came back after charging us a small fortune with a several hundred page analysis uh, showing that the Sci Fi Channel, based on their polling, would be more popular than MTV, which was extremely popular back then and at about the same level of popularity as Nickelodeon. So we used that Gallup report, we leveraged that in our meetings with cable operators to get distribution of the channel. So that's, um, and the Gallup report was really what sealed the deal uh, with Lori because now we had the strength of a reputable polling organization uh, behind our gut instinct that it would be successful. So then, jumping from that, it, it became very apparent to us that science fiction has, um, uh, people that are into science fiction are into science fiction, and you really need to be, um, you have to be respectful of that. And neither Mitchell nor I could go out into that community and say, you know, we're, we're aficionados. So we decided that we needed to bring on some real talent, some real heavyweight, um, names to help us as we were out there selling it and it's and selling as an entrepreneur that's what you do you have an idea and you have to sell it so we thought of the two leading names in the time uh, at the time Gene Roddenberry the creator of Star Trek and Isaac Asimov you mentioned um, what well, I think somebody mentioned it um, Isaac Asimov the really considered the, fa the father of science fiction the most prolific science fiction writer so uh, you could just take the attitude, I'm just going to call them up and say, hey, Gene, hey, Isaac, I want you to join my board of advisors. What do you think? Except I didn't know them, and they did, certainly didn't know us, and I didn't have their phone number. So you, uh, as an entrepreneur, we had to think about how do we get to these 
iconic men. How, how do we do it? And it was a long journey of finding people that had some connection with them, selling those people, and having them help us get to them. Ultimately, we were able to do that. And Gene Roddenberry and Isaac Asimov joined the board, and that was a huge moment in the time, in the development of the science fiction channel, sci-fi channel, because then we had our legitimacy. We could go out and speak to science fiction fans and if we brought Gene or Isaac or both, um, we got a lot of attention and we got a lot of press. And when you're trying to sell something, and today it's of course social media and influencers, but you need that. You need people out there touting your idea and helping you reinforce it so that people take you seriously. So we, we, we were talking earlier about raising cash as being something that many entrepreneurs have never had to do before. Uh, and you had to raise capital. Um, the two things that you've described, the Gallup report and the backing or endorsement, implicit endorsement of these two important people in the field must have been a, very significant in facilitating raising money. Not really. Okay. <laughs> um, well, that's encouraging. <laughs> so um, what, we, what we did is we had a whiteboard in our office, a very big whiteboard. And, and the answer is no, but it did become very helpful later. Um, and on that uh, whiteboard, we wrote at the top building blocks, foundational building blocks. And so we had a series of them, you know, create an outstanding board of advisors was one. The Gallup poll, number two. Um, and cable distribution, number three. And so all of these items had to be checked to get the funding. So no one piece in and of itself would, would be the key for the funding. It was a common, not, not to say we had to get every single thing on that whiteboard, but we were going to meetings to raise capital and we weren't being successful. We stopped counting when we hit 100 meetings. Um, so we were also meeting with cable operators, it took us over three years to, to sign the first top 100 cable operator in the country. We met with almost everyone, and we weren't told no. We were told, you're not ready yet. Get, or one of them said, uh, which, which satellite are, is your satellite transponder uh, going on? And we, we went, we had to go back to the whiteboard and add satellite transponder. Because uh, how do you get the darn thing into people's homes? You've got to beam it down from a satellite. And there were only, I'll just tell this one little piece, there were only two uh, satellite companies at the time, and each one had two satellites for the cable industry, uh, one uh, the primary and one a backup. So really, there was only two satellites up there. And uh, one was GE. And the other was Hughes, H-U-G-H-E-S, very large conglomerates. So we reached out to Hughes, and they wouldn't even meet with us because we didn't have our funding. So why even talk to us about a satellite transponder, which is millions of dollars? So then we went to GE, an even bigger company than Hughes, and the way we went to them is we went to the National Cable Show and walked up to their booth at the show. We didn't know anyone there. And just introduced, we asked for a salesman that we wanted to buy or lease a satellite transponder. And uh, they had like a little conference room in their large booth. And we went in there and we pitched this person. And he said, oh, this is a really cool idea. Let me get a few more people here. And then he, we sat down and he said, it's uh, $500,000 a year lease payments. And uh, we don't have, and, and our satellite's full, but we have a new one coming out that has extra capacity. Um, but we'll need your commitment of financing. And so I said, if we give you the first $500,000 up front, uh, can we get the transponder? And he said, well, that'll make a big positive difference. So um, we had been successful in the cable industry, so we wrote a check for $500,000 to get our satellite transponder, 
And I can tell you, when we were meeting with cable operators, and we had a slide, and it said that we had a satellite transponder from General Electric, and they knew how rare that would be for entrepreneurs to be able to get that, it almost put the financing question off the table. It gave us instant credibility. But can I just add one thing to that? So yes, we, we did write the check for $500,000. For all the entrepreneurs in the room, I want you to know that that was pretty much all the money we had. So it was a giant leap of faith. It was a huge gamble. Um, we believed that it would do the trick. And ultimately, it became extremely important. But again, I go back to the fact that as an entrepreneur, you do things that sometimes don't make much sense, but they do to you because you believe in your idea so much and you know that you're going to make it successful. You know that you're going to find a way that you take those risks. I'm not suggesting that anybody in this room do that, but it is part of our story. <laughs> well, M Mitchell, I remember in a prior conversation that we had, um, there was one quote uh, from you that I wrote down, which is, had I known how difficult it would be, I would never have done it. <laughs> That is true. <laughs> well, in hindsight, it doesn't seem that difficult, but yeah, it was, it was a torturous undertaking, to say the least. Yeah. Do you um, agree with that, Lori? Yeah, no, I definitely agree with that. Um, and and let, me just, uh, let me just add to that, so we're a married couple, um, and <laughs> that had its own trials and tribulations, um, but that's for the subject of something else. But uh, we also had a family, and I had young children at home. And at the time, uh, the, the, entire, the entire possibility of launching a cable network, you had to meet with cable operators all over the country. So I was constantly on a plane. I was constantly traveling, as were you. And that meant, um, how, you know, how do you take care of your family? How do you take care of what's going on at home? And also, we had staff. We had people that we had hired. How do you make sure they're doing their job and doing their work? And how do you make payroll? So all of these things we kind of jumped into with the attitude of, well, we'll figure it out. Um, and somehow we did. And, I, and again, I think that goes back to belief and uh, just knowing that you're going to figure it out. And, this, and enough things were happening in a positive sense that it kept, it kept us going on the right momentum. But also let me share with you, a lot of things that were happening were of a negative sense. As Mitchell mentioned, it was years and years and we couldn't get people to pay attention to us because we didn't have the financing. We didn't have, at the time, it was what, 75 to $100 million to launch a cable channel, um, which, um, you know, today it's different because today you have so many, you have YouTube and you have, you know, the whole internet. You've got so many ways to, to um, you know, enter the field. That's good news and there's bad news. A lot of competition. It's very, very easy to, to be um, in that arena. How do you get attention? So you touched on the perfect segue to my question, which is two entrepreneurs in the same household, um, work partners and life partners. How do you... Um, get time off of work. <laughs> Do you have an answer for me? <laughs> <laughs> Certainly you not. You don't. You don't. We're, we're both wired to be on all the time. It's just, and, and we both are. Um, you're on all the time. But it's interesting. Our, our, we're different. We, we attack different segments of business. So it, it, it does work well together. Um, sure, there were plenty of times I was throwing, you know, staplers and all kinds of things at him because he didn't see things my way. And I just ran out of patience to try and negotiate with him. Just see it my way. I'm right. Um, but you know, you get through those things. And ultimately, at the end of the day, we agreed on more things um, than we disagreed. So it's, it's interesting. It's not for everybody. Um, because we have different last names, many times people didn't realize we were married. So it would obviously come up at some point and especially in the financing world, and things have changed a little bit since then, uh, but people were very direct back then where we would hear once they found out, uh, we will not finance a married couple as the two senior executives. What if you guys get divorced? What if you get separated? Um, we just won't do it, or we've had a bad experience doing it. So then we just lied in the future. We were, you know, we just said we were not married. 
Well, hopefully for all <laughs> of you out there. That's a bad rumor. Yeah, hopefully it for is, all you out there, those days are over. It is pre-internet after all. You yeah. could get away with it, right? Um, so part of being an entrepreneur is hearing the no's. And I've heard a lot of stories here today already about risk and persistence and no's. Tell us about a time when you turned a no into a yes. So, I mean, that happened a lot. Probably the biggest was um, we had the idea that we would, you know, for those that have been to uh, Universal Theme Park, you're aware, I think it's still there, um, that they had a Nickelodeon exhibit there. Um, that, was very po that was very popular. So the idea was that we would go to Disney and suggest putting a Sci-Fi Channel exhibit in uh, Disney MGM Studios theme park, now called Disney Studios, Hollywood Studios or whatever. And so um, our, um, so we were living and, and working in Boca Raton, so we knew from having gone to Disney World that they dealt with a bank called Flagship Bank. It's since merged, it's some other bank now. But that's where we banked. So we knew the general manager of the Boca Raton branch of Flagship Bank. So I made an appointment to see him, told him what we were doing, and could he introduce us to the head of Walt Disney World so we could pitch him on Sci-Fi Channel going into Dis Disney MGM Studios comparable to Nickelodeon and Universal. And he said, oh, sure, I'll, I'm very friendly with the guy. I'll call him for you, which he did. And the, and the general manager um, uh, agreed to meet with us. So it started literally in small little bank branch in Boca Raton. We're now in, and meanwhile, we don't have any financing and barely any cable operator signups. So, which, came, which became apparent in that first meeting when he asked us those questions. Which cable operators are supporting it? Do you have your financing in place? Who is it with, et cetera, et cetera. The satellite thing got us, you know, a little bit of, of um, credibility, but not, you know, nothing was happening. So he said that he was a science fiction fan and that he, because we had mentioned Isaac Asimov, he loves Isaac Asimov. Could we get him some Isaac Asimov books signed by Isaac Asimov? So we sent Isaac this you know, box of the books that we, we told us which books, and we put this whole package together and, and sent it to him. So he agreed to pitch it to um, um, the, the you know, to corporate at Walt Disney, to the head of real estate at Walt Disney, because essentially that person controls who goes into the theme park. Um, and he got back to us and said, um, it was rejected. <laughs> um, there's no way until you actually launch and they can watch it on their television set that they would even consider it. Um, so I said, well, I'm not taking no for, meanwhile, this is like a year in process. So we went out to, uh, he, he said, he's willing to meet with you, but it's a waste of time. So we go out to California, go onto the lot where the corporate headquarters are. It's actually in, I don't know if it's still there, but it was in the animation building, because that's where Walt Disney had his offices. And um, we had 30 minutes, go in, uh, gave him like a five minute pitch on the satellite transponder and all that stuff. And he said, I mean, he said, there's no question that you guys have a high probability of getting this thing done. Just come back to us when it's done. But I'm afraid the answer is no. So as we were shaking hands to leave, I turned around and I said, one more, one more thing, one last try. He goes, go for it. And I said, you know, I'm really surprised, and this just occurred to me, I had not thought of this before, I'm really surprised that with everything we've put together, that if the Walt Disney Company were to get behind this, that don't you think that cable operators would want to jump on and then everything else would come into place? So literally that announcement, which would be based strictly on the strength of the Disney brand, 
would catapult this. So he said, interesting. And then as we, he, then he shook our hands again. As we started to leave, he said, wait a minute, I changed my mind. We're going to get behind this. And there was a press conference and a press release in Walt Disney World. And um, we signed up about a third of the top 100 cable operators in the weeks that followed that announcement. And content was never an issue. You always had enough content. What worried me and what Lori and I was that the idea was out there and that someone else would do it, a big media company. And so it always puzzled us that no one did. And so why was that? And it, then it became obvious that when we went to get programming, because we had to start actually licensing programming, and there was ways to do it without coming up with much money that we found out about. Um, but as we were doing it, uh, there was very little science fiction programming available for license. And so we quickly discovered um, that it was classified under action adventure in their, um, again, pre-internet, in their files and stuff. So if you ask for science fiction, it was very narrow because action adventure sold for higher license fees than science fiction programming back then. You know, we're talking about the old stuff. So once we said, okay, give us your action adventure list, there was tons of science, science fiction on there, enough to do two channels. So it was really just that, but the people in the industry who license programming are more like, many of them are more like accountants. They have to get a certain number of hours, they look at the past ratings, they use different algorithms, and they never actually look per se, they don't really care what the title is. They're not programmers like you would think of today, or you would think of if you were just thinking about it rationally. They don't know what the heck these programs are. So, that, so people that did, there were big media companies that said, hey, is that a good idea? And they went and asked their people, go look, how much program is available, can we do this? And, and they were told there's very little available. So we heard a lot of this afterward. So that's the reason no one did it. There were a couple media companies we spoke to about partnering with us and getting the financing and they weren't willing to do it because it was too high profile. If it failed, they could lose their jobs. Which is, which is the opportunity for entrepreneurs. Big yeah. companies don't want to take the chance, they don't want to take the risk, they would lose their job, they have too many people, too many layers they need to report to. Whereas an entrepreneur is in a position to make those decisions and you know, turn on a dime. And that gives, that's a competitive advantage. Um, and so sometimes you say, well, I can't do that, I'm an entrepreneur. And you know, in, in our case, we were concerned about Disney and Turner and Warner Brothers and you know, Warner, it, it, all the big players. It just made so much sense for them to do it. Too much risk. And entrepreneurs, they love risk. So one, one little uh, uh, story about entrepreneurism and, and, well, and crisscross with luck. Um, we were invited to speak at a Dark Shadows convention. So Dark Shadows, if you're not aware, was an extremely popular um, horror soap opera that ran for years and had an immense, so once it went off the air, it had an underground and immense fan following beyond anything that I could think of today. And there were clubs, and they had an annual convention, and all sorts of things. So we licensed Dark Shadows, not because it's great programming, and we get tremendous ratings, but because of its avid fan following, and there's a ton of episodes. So on a per episode license fee, it was cheap. And we needed a lot of programming. So um, we get up. And, they, and we said, and there was over a thousand people in the ballroom of what, whatever it was, the Hilton Hotel or whatever in downtown New York. 
First we said, why are we spending our money going to a Dark Shadows convention? Because they weren't paying for you know, the airfare and stuff. Then you know, we had committed to it, so we went. So I, Lori or I said, I don't remember. Um, it is true, because we heard these questions as we were walking up to the podium to speak. Is it true that you have licensed Dark Shadows? So went up and said, it is true, we have licensed Dark Shadows. That was all we were able to say. Pandemonium broke out in the room. They literally didn't want to hear anything else we had to say. So, so that was it. So we walked out and I said, you see, we didn't need to come here. We just needed to maybe send a letter or something. <laughs> so um, on the way out, um, and we were like swarmed with people wanting to touch us. Like, so on the way out, um, an individual, after we got through the, the crowds, individual chased us down uh, wearing a business suit, not a typical dark shadows person. And he said, I would like to interview you for my paper. And so wh what paper is that? He went, the Wall Street Journal. I said, what are you doing here? <laughs> he said, well, once a week, and this column is not there anymore, we run a column on quirky stuff, and it's on the front page, the middle of the front page, and it's once a week. So we want to make, we were, we were going to make the column on Dark Shadows, now we want to make it on the Sci-Fi Channel. And using Dark Shadows as the example, and what just went on that he witnessed the pandemonium, which he felt would happen when the channel launched for the channel itself. So, so that was just pure luck. We easily, easily could have passed on that uh, meeting. Well, we were, we were running to get out, so it was just kind of amazing that he caught up with us and we were willing to, to have the interview. And of course, you know, when you get that much um, ink, as they say, in the Wall Street Journal, people do start to uh, take your calls and they start to recognize the fact that you've become mainstream. It's not this quirky idea that uh, you know two entrepreneurs are thinking about. So, so all, all of these stories, I think, are fantastic because they're all related to how an entrepreneur builds credibility for his or her idea. Um, there's one one final question I want to ask you, though, about the Sci-Fi uh, Channel. When you sold to USA Network, why did you sell? And did you ever feel later that you'd sold too early, which is the schadenfreude of many an entrepreneur? Um, it, it was quite a bit of money, and we felt um, that um, competition could still develop from a large media company. Um, and the programming at the level that we wanted it was beyond our capabilities and reach. And yes, we regretted it. It was very hard for us to watch it today. No, I can watch. I can watch it. I'm just fine with it. All right, all right. <laughs> <laughs> but we had. And I'll just finish this up by, by saying we had um, an incredible experience. We launched the channel, and it was at the Hayden Planetarium. Was that? It was at the Hayden Planetarium yeah, in New York, and Leonard Nimoy turned the switch on. Yeah, it was, it was amazing. So at the table, after four years of working so hard to create this vision, this dream, we had on one side of us the widow of Isaac Asimov, and on the other side of us the widow of Gene Roddenberry. They had both passed away right before the channel had been launched. And and I will share with you that when that, that switch, and it's very ceremonial, but there's a switch that goes down that you know, starts the juice going. It, it said that the Sci-Fi Channel will be forever dedicated to the memory of Isaac Asimov and Gene Roddenberry. So that's something that will live on uh, forever. And as a result of that, as a result of that, there is a commitment to the type of programming that will be played on the Sci-Fi Channel. And you know, Sharknado may not be your favorite, but you know, there are people out there that really like that. Um, but it, it's, it's, um, it sparked something in an audience. And I'm an entrepreneur. We're entrepreneurs. It's all about changing the landscape. That's what gets us dreaming and, and making a reality. So you make your money from the sale. Then you have to think of something else to do. What's that experience like? Do you say to yourself, 
I'm going to take a round the world cruise and uh, spend a little, relax a little, and then I'll come up with a new idea? Or is your appetite for the new idea so strong that you're immediately searching for the next uh, act? Oh, yeah. Well, so after two and a half years on our yacht in the Mediterranean, no, 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 no. Um, it went more along the lines, well, what do we do now? We were still fairly young, and we didn't want to, we had no intention of just calling it in. So at that point, um, I'll let you take some of it over. There were a lot of things that we developed. Um, Hollywood.com, MovieTickets.com, Broadway.com, and now uh, Misfits Gaming, huge in, uh, global esports organization. And uh, we're not done. There's still plenty of things, I can't talk about them, um, that we're working on. But why don't you talk about those days after we sold the Sci-Fi Channel? Um, so we, we did get a nice payday, so that was good. Um, look, part of the reason one starts a business, especially if you're building it from scratch, is to see it exist. And another is if you've never had serious money before, building something big and selling it gets you serious money. So it relieves pressure that a lot of people feel, uh, security and things like that. So in, in many ways, there are benefits to entrepreneurism. Um, so in terms of what we did afterward is we started you know, essentially all over again. And we like to think big, so we you know, have tackled some big uh, projects. Um, we got involved with a uh, venture capital fund called Advance It which is uh, Sherry Redstone's uh, venture capital fund. Um, we're not as active in it as we were in the beginning. Um, so we're part of the GP group in Advance It 2 and 3. And we were um, consultants in, in one. And we've been investors in it. And, they, and we've had some home runs. Uh, Masterclass, you may be familiar with. Um, um, policy, uh, policy? What's it? I can't even think of it. Public, public. It's public, a competitor yeah. to Robin Hood. Um, each of these um, is a unicorn. So we've had in, in advanced at two and three, two unicorns, but we're like junior GPs in, um, in those funds, and we're not active anymore in it. So that was, a, that was you know, interesting and fun. We enjoy working with young entrepreneurs. So one of the things that we did um, was we, got, we bought Hollywood.com. We, we bought the, the URL, URL and built it. It's a, it's, it's still, we're still um, co-CEOs to this day. Um, at the time, early on, we were publishing entertainment information. We even had a, an e-retail uh, component to it, but we felt that the, to go full cycle, we needed to sell movie tickets on Hollywood.com. So we came up with the concept of being able to buy a movie ticket from your computer. And the challenge there, obviously, was to create the technology, which we did. And the next challenge was to get movie theaters to sign on with you. And now it's everybody knows that it's perfectly fine and hugely successful. But back then, it was another situation where you had to go and you had to sell and you had to convince the movie theater owners that they will sell more tickets by signing up and having the opportunities to sell electronically. So we did that and very successful. And as a, after a period of time, long period of time, um, we wound up selling it because that's what entrepreneurs do uh, for the most part. It's very rare to actually have an idea, build it, and keep it for a long time. It happens, but usually it's an idea, you build it, and then you sell, and you go on to the next idea. Um, but we did sell it, and now we are in the process of getting back into the business of selling movie tickets because it's an interesting space, especially since we've just come through the pandemic where we all have learned to live with streaming. Um, we see, we have a vision of what movie theater experience is going to be like. Um, and that's, again, you know, kind of seeing, being a bit of a futurist and seeing the landscape, maybe not today, but what it will look like in the future. 
Um, so we're jumping back on that wagon. And the, um, oh, you want to say something? Okay, go ahead. So that was um, movietickets.com that we started, and we sold that to Fandango in 2019. Is that right? Okay, give or take. And um, so we originally wanted to do it on Hollywood.com, but the movie theater chains, who were our partners, um, wanted it on a um, you know, more of a utilitarian brand, which was fine. We also owned movietickets.com. We bought Hollywood.com originally. It came with movietickets.com, and it was just sitting on the shelf. So we used that. That got sold as I mentioned, to Fandango. So now we're going back in to the business and launching in roughly 30 days. So we've been working on it with a team of developers through the pandemic. And we've come up with, um, as a group effort, a new way of doing ticketing, not just movie ticketing. We're also going to be doing Broadway ticketing, live theater ticketing, and eventually uh, sports and concert ticketing. But what we've come up with is a way to um, buy on a single page um, page where you can essentially flip layers of the screen, but it's the same page that's moving to compare theaters and times. And uh, we've patented the technology. And uh, we're launching. We'll be in about 50%, maybe a little more, of the country. Um, so we have to go out and sign up the movie theater chains and all of that. Um, okay. so, so before we go to questions from the audience, which I, I think that the dean wants us to do. Want to say one thing? Yeah, so um, if I could just say one thing about our latest venture. It's called Misfits Gaming. And it's an eSports venture for those of you in the audience who don't know what that is, it's professional video game, uh, video gaming, I'll make that a verb. Um, and it was interesting because of our background in traditional media, understanding content creation and how to monetize content. The concept of esports for us is really all about creating content. And it's, you know, that yes, there's gaming and yes, there's sports, but people watch it and they, you know, it's, it's the creation of, of these mega stars, these influencers in this space um, that was so compelling to us. So we, we jumped in when it was still very, very Wild West um, about five or six years ago. And today, of course, there's now franchises for various games, League of Legends, Overwatch, and Call of Duty. Um, we all know Fortnite. I mean, there's just you know, Minecraft. It's, it's huge. It's huge. But again, because our background was steeped in traditional media, we saw, again, a bit of a futurist, we saw the potential for this. And we've all seen it bear out. So um, let, let's uh, take, take a few questions, if we may. Um, we have uh, microphones available. Caitlin uh, has the mic. Uh, so there's a question up here, Caitlin, uh, towards the front. But uh, while, while you're getting that in place, just explain to the audience, if you could, what is the business model of eSports? How do you make uh, revenue and profit from eSports? What mix of uh, revenue streams? Well, it, very similar to traditional sports. So we get league revenue sharing which is sponsorships and ad sales done at the league level. So, and there, the, the broadcasters, if you will, are the Twitches and YouTubes of the world, um, and different ones like Billy Billy in Asia. Um, and uh, they pay, they pay, um, they receive, uh, uh, they pay significant license fees for those rights to the league, and then the league distributes that to the video game publisher and to each of the teams that are franchised. So there's 10 in 10 League of Legends teams in Europe. I won't go into too much detail, but suffice it to say it's like having, in our view, an NBA team 15 or 20 years ago in terms of the value proposition. Uh, there's other ways in which to make money. We sell our own ads. Um, 
We have as shareholders EW Scripps, which is a large uh, publicly traded broadcast company here in the US. They're helping us with ad sales. Um, and then uh, another shareholder you may have heard of, the Miami Heat, um, and the Cleveland Browns. We have some other big shareholders. I don't want to leave anyone out, but those I highlight. All right, so let, let's take your question, if we may. Awesome. So how does an entrepreneur stick with their vision and like, keep that strategy throughout the time and execute it? I'm sorry, I didn't hear the question. How do you, st how do you stick with your vision and uh, develop the strategy throughout the time that it takes to uh, make it? Yeah, it's not easy because sometimes you're, you know, you're being bombarded by a lot of other things that are distracting. But you have to be very, very focused. Um, we're both lawyers by background, and one of the things they teach you in, in law school, and I'm sure you get a good education in business school, um, is to identify what your, what your issues are, what your obstacles are, and how you're going to deal with them. So you, st you have to stay focused, you have to believe in what you're doing. So in terms of time management, you have to devote basically everything to it. Uh, I... let, let, let's see if there are a couple more questions. Uh, yeah, please, go ahead, sir. Um, thanks for the conversation. I really appreciate it. My name is Adele Lajon. I'm a founder of um, AO Analytics. So I did consulting, but my question was, how do you keep the, you think the whole point of entrepreneur is that you have to sell what do you have a business model with that outside of percentage and you will create a subsidiary of my original company? What about that model? You want to take that? You want to repeat that? Uh, can, can, you, can you just uh, say it one more time? It's uh, You're creating a subsidiary of your own original company? Yes, so they say, they mentioned that in entrepreneurship, you always have to sell your idea and move on to the next. What if you sell a percentage of that and be like, you all can create a company, we'll finance you, but it's just a branch of my original company. Oh, it's a percentage of it. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah. equity. Why don't you take that? Uh, yeah, I mean, there's an unlimited number of ways to structure financing. The, the You have to keep an open mind, but eventually, in order to raise money, typically you have to give up equity. So the goal is to give up as little as possible. And whether you put them in subsidiaries or affiliate companies or how you do it, you need a very good lawyer, transaction lawyer, and they can be, many of them will work for warrants or what, no, I say many, some will work for warrants, uh, especially West Coast lawyers, not necessarily around this area in the Silicon Valley area and so on, they're used to dealing with startups. So they have programs, if they like the idea, where they will work with you and they'll take a, a small piece of the action. So, and then they can help structure it to fit what you're doing, uh, rather than trying to figure it out completely on your own. And, if, and, th and also that lends credibility to the venture, having a quality boutique you know, firm like that. All right, let's see uh, if we have another one. Uh, two more. Hi, um, my name is Cade, and I'm in Professor Major's strategic management class. And you two mentioned that you practice law together, and I was wondering how much you value your law background and your entrepreneur endeavors. Well, I'm going to take that one. Because um, if you've ever heard me speak, I, I, I treasure my, my law background. It really taught me how to think, how to stay focused. And uh, I entered law school as one person, and I, I graduated as another person. And I've taken that ability with me every single step of the way. There are so many things. I have lawyers that, that work for me. I read every contract because I know my business. I know it's going to trip up. And I, uh, <laughs> nothing's ever perfect. Somehow when you get to uh, uh, work in the road, oh, I didn't think of that one. But I'm always using those skills. So my law degree to me has been enormously valuable. I would add, do not sign any contract without reading it and understanding it. 
I could repeat that. Do not sign any contract without reading and understanding it. Very important. All right. I think, I think there was one more. Are we ready? Hi. My name is Laura. Um, my question to you guys, you both mentioned you had successful law careers before going and taking that risk to start your own business. Can you go through a little bit the decision process of the timing? How long did you guys sit on this idea before making the jump? And then kind of what kind of went through your thought process? So um, with regard to the timing, when we decided that we wanted to, we had owned we practiced law together, but we had owned cable systems, and we were practicing law. We were we were operating those systems. There came a point in time when we sold those systems, and that was that was the juncture when we decided we wanted to do a cable network. And so we figured we would continue to practice law, and we would. Uh, okay, thank you. You see, he's I keep him around because he helps me with these things. So, um, but anyway, we decided that this was something we were going to work on. And eventually, it became apparent it was a full-time venture. So it kind of played itself out. It's not like we decided, well, you know, a year from now, we're going to only do this. It kind of played itself out. And that was when we had to make the decision, do we really do this? Or do we pull back and kind of stay where we are? And, well, you know the rest of the story. Uh, I think we're getting close to the, uh, the 7 o'clock hour. Uh, Patricia, do you have uh, one last question, perhaps? I or? do. I do. I want to know what you would have done with the satellite transponder had this not worked out. <laughs> you were listening. <laughs> not sure. I didn't think about that. <laughs> you know what? That's a good answer. The, yeah, that didn't exactly think right. about that. Exactly and right. you know what? We never thought things wouldn't work out. We always knew we'd figure out a way. So, so I have one last question as well for you, Laurie, which is um, the enormous amount of time you've dedicated to uh, public service and leading nonprofit organizations. Why, why do you do that, and what, what are the rewards as a business person of also doing that? Well, thank you for the question. Um, first of all, I, I do what I do for the University of Miami because I am passionate about the University of Miami. It is a great institution, so it's easy for me to commit my time. But you know, after spending years of my life working um, and, and building up businesses together, which has been a wonderful experience, um, it became very important for me as a person to fulfill, to be the best person I could be, to give back, and also, um, quite frankly, I had a lot of obstacles um, as I was going through the process as a woman. And so a lot of the things that I do, um, I try to help women understand and, and re reach their value. Um, it's, it's important that women in leadership positions do that so that the next generation knows it's not as difficult today and, and women have a much easier time of it, but there's still some obstacles out there. And if I can do one little thing to help, um, I feel it's an obligation. But I do love this part of my, my career path. Well, thank you so much. And we love uh, the fact that uh, you are so dedicated to the University of Miami and thank you for your service to us. And uh, Mitchell, thank you very much for uh, joining Laurie here this evening. And uh, appreciate all of you coming. Um, and we have some refreshments uh, for all of you to enjoy. Uh, and uh, Laurie and Mitchell, I'm sure, will be glad to mingle uh, for a few minutes uh, uh, after we uh, end the formal program. But again, thanks to uh, uh, Professor Amat and Professor Major and all of your students. Uh, fantastic job. Thank you.